The title of today's message is inspired by a quote from Dr. Stephen Francis in a book that I read this week called Anointing and Fragrance. In it, he said, prayer and the word are the twins given by God to make us be like him. Let me say it again. Prayer and the word are the twins given by God to make us be like him. Well, when you read that, you want to, yes, find out what that really means. You want to press into that to know how is it that I can be more like him. That's my desire. That's what my heart wants. That's what every one of us, even I would dare say, come here to gather is to teach me, Lord. Show me something so that I can receive understanding to know you more. Amen? And throughout that book, there were so many valuable divine nuggets, as I would call it there, that gave understanding of how that anointing comes through a person, through a Christian, as we surrender to God in prayer, as we allow ourselves to be pressed, to be crushed. Did you know that in the incense and when it talks about all through Leviticus and all the different things of how they're supposed to do it and the, and the censers that they put the incense in, until that incense was crushed just right and then fire put on it, then it released the aroma. Okay? That's just a very shallow part of what should be a whole month of messages, okay? But if we understand that there is, number one, an anointing, and it is released through prayer and God's Word, but through that crushing, through that pressing that we feel as we press in to God Almighty through prayer, and it releases a fragrance that is a sweet aroma unto God. It's some very, very cool stuff. So, of course, we understand that God's Word has credibility. Amen? Second Timothy chapter 3. Go with me. If you don't have a Bible, we do have Bibles on the back table. Uh, please, you're welcome to take one. They are free. But open the actual physical paper Bible, if you have one with you, uh, or your Bible apps, and turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Here it is in, in the 16th and the 17th verse. You can put those verses up on the screen if you want to. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Read with me, beginning in verse 16. It says, All Scripture... Every bit of God's Word. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It's good. It's, it's solid for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Boy, I want to take heed to it. I want to understand more uh, about that. Verse 17 why? Why is it valid? Why is God's Word even reputable? Because the man, that the man of God, may be perfect. Or, as I usually prefer to say, if perfect bothers some of you, mature. 
okay, that the man of God may be mature. He might grow up, okay? Throughly, some versions of the Bible will say thoroughly, but King James will say throughly furnished unto all good works. Throughly furnished. That means adequately equipped. It means fitted. It means God's Word, hallelujah, is able to take us into that place where we can press in to know Him. Oh my, this is exciting stuff. This is good stuff. I want to encourage you. Get into His Word. Let's go to that next screen, please. We see this twinning, as I'll call it, brought forth in the first four verses of Acts chapter 6. The apostles had to settle the, the, the issue of being so busy and so occupied uh, that it resulted in neglecting some of the needs or overlooking some of the needs of the certain widows and people in the early church. And so what did they do? They prayed. And they set in seven men of, listen, honest report, of honest report and full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom who could assist everyone so that in verse 4 of Acts chapter 6, it says, we, the disciples, the apostles, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. Hallelujah. Prayer and God's Word are a natural combination throughout all of the Bible. Go to the next screen for me, please. We also can confirm that prayer and the Word are, are twin powerhouses. As the Gospel of John records the words of Jesus in chapter 15, verse 7. Turn with me, John chapter 15 and verse 7. The words of Jesus, listen very closely. He said, if you abide in me, if you abide in me, if you take time, if you take choice to abide in him, and my words abide in you, <laughs> I love this, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Life verse, brethren, amen? And if we go down, stay right in that same chapter 15 and go down to verse 16, listen again to what it says. The words of Jesus. He said, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. Some of you might say, hold on, you know, not me, I'm not ordained. You know, I didn't go to seminary school. Well, maybe, thank God, you didn't, okay? But he has ordained each and every one of you. Yeah, his word just said it. What am I supposed to do with it? Say, well, maybe not you. He says, I have ordained you because he has called you. He breathed his life of breath into you. He says, you haven't chosen me. I've chosen you because of my love for you. And I've ordained you. Come on, people. That you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. Now listen. That whatsoever you ask, whatsoever you pray, of the Father in my name, he may give it you. 
brothers and sisters, if we need to go back to the very first chapter of Genesis, that's what we will do. When he says, I've ordained you, all you have to do is go to Genesis 1.28. After he had made all of the things, after the word was spoken and made and created all things, then in verse 28, he says, and God blessed them, man. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion. There's your ordination. There's your ordination. Have dominion. Over what? Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. God has chosen you and has ordained you that your fruit might be complete. That you would bring, again, praise and honor to the Creator. So that as you pray, whatsoever you will, in my Father's name, Jesus said, I, <laughs> I will give it to you. Oh God, this is such a, a blessing to hear God's word and let it come down into our hearts. Can I get an amen? Kind of quiet out there. You know, Coach Vince Lombardi is quoted as saying to the Green Bay Packers on a first day of a training camp. He said, gentlemen, this is a football. And he held up a football. I'm sure that these players under the, you know, in the presence of a very, very good coach, was expecting some really, really deep revelation and some deep thing that would just bring everything together, that would help them to be the top winners, to achieve, be the best. But what did he say? He took a football, held it in the air, and he said, gentlemen, this is a football. Some may have mumbled or uttered under their breath, duh. But he knew, come on, he knew that the key to winning was to master the fundamentals. This is a football. This is the game we're playing. I'm going to teach that to you. And his record proved him right. Okay? In nine seasons, he amassed a record of uh, 89, 29, and 4. 89 wins. Only 29 losses, four ties, with five NFL championships, two of them being Super Bowl wins in 1966 and 1967. I've done my research, okay? Yeah. Gentlemen, brothers and sisters, this is the Bible. We're going back to the basic fundamentals. This is what it's going to take. It may seem simple. It might be some words. It might be too small a print. It might be words that I can't quite understand. It may be all of that, but this is a Bible. And God's inspiration is written all through it. If you want a text, if you're really into social media, well, then open it up. 
There's 66 chapters of text from our God. That's why God's word and prayer will be the winning twins in this game of life. A Christian's best way to master the fundamentals is to cultivate a desire to know more about God, to pray, and to read the Bible. We need to understand the power of getting back to the basics of these twins, prayer and God's Word. Amen? You know, it's interesting to note, as I was preparing this here and reading through the Gospels, it's interesting to note that in the three and a half years of the ministry of Jesus, he didn't teach them to flow in the power gifts. Power gifts. I'm talking about gifts of healing, gifts of special faith, the, the uh, working of miracles. You can read about all of the power gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, the first 11 verses. Read all about them. Instead, he taught them, listen, how to pray and to not get discouraged in prayer. Oh, don't you know that we need this? That's what Jesus taught. That was his life while he was on this earth and with and in the presence of his disciples. That's what he taught them. Go with me, go to the next screen here. Go with me to Luke chapter 11, verse 1. We're seeing a parallel to this same verse, same words in Matthew 6, beginning in verse 9. But in Luke 11, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass that as he was praying, as Jesus was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. And of course, from this, we should all be familiar with what is commonly called the Lord's Prayer. And we've said before, it really is not a proper description because it's not the Lord's Prayer. It's more like the Apostles or the Disciples' Prayer. Because the Lord was not asking for forgiveness, as a part of that prayer says. This is the Apostles' Prayer. This is what Jesus taught to his disciples. And he said, after this manner, here's what and how you can pray. And he taught them also to never get discouraged. We read that in Luke chapter 18 and verse 1. Luke 18 verse 1 here's where it says and he spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint of course the verses that follow that in Luke 18 talk about the parable of the widow that persisted after a judge so that she could be avenged so that the situation that she was in she was after this judge and we read in that account of in that parable where the judge even acknowledges that hey I'm not even a godly man but just to get rid of this woman just to get this thing settled here I will hear her I will avenge her and of course it goes on into a very deep deep parable for you and I to understand that Jesus said if even an unrighteous judge like this can be talked into, can be, you know, agreed with to take care of something. Just think of what my heavenly Father is like. Just think of how good God is and what He is doing for you. Amen? You know, I find 
that the disciples knew to ask Jesus about how to pray and that that was to them far more important than anything else because they personally witnessed what Jesus was doing. They personally witnessed that power of intimate prayer and how Jesus would come back, oftentimes recorded many times through the Word. It will say he retreated. He went up into the mountain. He came back down. And you could very likely see the presence and the light of God Almighty on him as he came back after he, Jesus Christ, a man, son of God, made like you and I, who had to get encouraged himself. He went to the Father. That's why the disciples said, my, oh, my, teach us how to pray. And so the words that he gave them as an example of how to pray, even began with our Father, Abba. <laughs> Do you see it? Jesus said, here's where you start. Start with that relationship of, I know my Father. And he is so very, very good. And he loves me so, so much. Our Father. And then it ended. For thine is the kingdom. And everything in between was all about our Father and about his kingdom. When people would surrender and pray. Think about it. He started off, Our Father, hallowed be thy name. It means it cries out, Holy are you, Lord. And it gave them, it gives us that understanding of the holiness of a really, really good Father who loves us and that reciprocal love that we must return to him. It goes on and it gives us understanding that this earth is temporal. Thy kingdom come, that our real home, God's kingdom, was in heaven. It gave, gave us a chance that we could pray to him, thy will be done, and expect to see his will that it could be done right here on earth in this town, in this place, this day. Right here on earth as it is in heaven. And it gave us understanding, gave the disciples understanding that they could understand that his daily bread, the Word, the Bible, the Word of God was our daily bread. And that's what we could eat. And that's what we could live off of. That forgiveness was a must, just as he would forgive us. And they'd understand that he would be with us through the fire, through the temptations, never allowing us to go through more than what we can handle. That's God's word. That's God's promises. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory and we can see all things fulfilled and come to pass in our lives hallelujah now Jesus did not just leave them with that understanding of how to pray but he most assuredly told them also about the available power that they would be empowered with through the Holy Ghost and as believers. Read with me. Open to Mark chapter 16. And reading 17 and 18, verses 17 and 18 in Mark 16, here's what it says. And these signs shall follow them that believe. Are you a believer? Yes. 
These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. Hallelujah. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Can I get an amen? And also in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, he says, Behold, take notice, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. These are promises spoken by the Master. Words from His Holy Bible that we can pray into and declare and believe that these are for us. Now Jesus also reminded the disciples of the forfeiture of what they would lose of that power if we tried doing it on our own. The Gospel of John chapter 15 and verse 5 says this, I'm the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, there it is again, he that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Plain truth. Through this example of how to pray, it gives us, each and every one of us, the determination of never representing in action anything that you have not found in prayer. Do you understand me? We should not be doing, saying, having anything to do with any part of our daily lives if it has not been a part of prayer, of seeking God, of asking Him, Lord, how do I do this? Even in your job, even in a simple thing of doing your housework or of, of doing daily tasks, of getting the groceries, of filling up your car with gas, ask, Jesus said, for understanding so that every action we have is combined with the power of God's Word. Prayer, you see, is the connection that we can make with the heart of God that gives us the authority to represent, or should I say, represent Him with absolute confidence. That is what prayer does. It's the connection that we can make with the heart of God that gives us the authority to represent, to represent Jesus with absolute confidence. How do we have that confidence? Because He first loved us. That's why we can even do anything. Come on. When we know how to humble ourselves in prayer and with a repentant heart, that verse in Second Chronicles 7.14 that gets repeated and quoted all over will come to have some understanding to you when we come to Him in prayer. Second Chronicles 7.14, what is it? Okay, it says, If my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn, repent, then will I hear from heaven and will heal their land. There's something to understanding God's Word and the place that we can confidently come to and say, this is mine. This is for me. If we are abiding in Him. You know, I've heard it said that 98% of answers to prayer 
is you say, okay, come on, tell me, tell me, tell me. 98% of the answers to prayers, well, I've already quoted it to you at the beginning. The answer to that, where 98%, if that's an accurate figure, and I believe it is, to an answered prayer is found in John that we quoted at the beginning back to the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 7. John 15, 7, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done for you. There's the answers to our prayers. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. And I think our positioning in prayer would be significantly different if we acted on the words of Jesus where he said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am, there am I in the midst of them. Come on, what if? (laughs) What if? What if we would really believe that? (laughs) I'm asking you, what if? What if God's word was true? (laughs) It is true. He said where two or three are gathered in my name. We are gathered here in my name. You heard it in the greeting at the beginning. We are gathered here. We welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we welcome him here. We welcome his presence Where two or three, I see a whole lot more than two or three in the middle of you. What if we would just dare to believe that? Come, Holy Ghost. Come, walk the aisles. Come, hallelujah. Manifest your presence. How about the angels? How about each one that has all God's glory? Just saturate. Come on. This is God's word. This is going to be a real, real happening where that presence, where God's favor is going to manifest right here, right now. It is by faith. Jesus, I welcome you. I welcome you here. I welcome the angels. I welcome the healing. I thank you, Lord Jesus. Almighty. Let's go to that next screen, please. Hallelujah. We need to get a hold about that twin power of prayer and his word. Because I read in first John chapter four, verse seventeen, herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is so are we in this world (laughs) do you carry the presence of jesus christ as he is come on go back to it first john 4 17 memorize it get it into your heart as he is as he walks, as he is in here, as he is in this presence of, of, of us, as he is, so are we in this world. Well, I'm telling you, we've got to get back to the basics. We've got to get back to the Bible, and we've got to start reading what it says about you and about me and start believing it and start proclaiming it and start encouraging each other with it. Hallelujah. In Matthew chapter 13, we see a very familiar parable. And I wanted to touch on it only because as I was preparing this message This weekend, Jesus speaks 
And he says, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. We're reading from uh, verse 18. Then cometh the wicked one, catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. Now if you jump down to verse 23, same chapter, Matthew 13, verse 23, it says, but he that received seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Capture these things in that parable of the sower. Capture these words that we just read. He that hears the word of the kingdom. He that receives the word. Now if we just pause a minute there. Keep your finger in Matthew 18 there. But in 2 Corinthians 5, beginning verse 17 and going through 21, I want to read this to you. Because there's something that we want to make sure we understand. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Can I say? They're dead. They're gone. Never to be brought up again. We're a new creature. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Wasn't that truly what God's purpose was? Was to reconcile man back to God because man stumbled. He sinned. He flopped. He blew it. But because of the love of God, he sent Jesus Christ who died on a cross, a curse, so that we could be reconciled back to him. And all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and, and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we, you and I, are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we, you and I, might be made the righteousness of God in him. Boom. That's good stuff. That's good read. Thank you, Pastor Mark. That was really, really good. But keep reading, because really it shouldn't have a chapter break here. Chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 says, We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted and in the day of salvation have I secured thee. That means he's given assistance to us. He's aided us. He's helped us. He's helped you and I. Behold, now, now, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. God's word is so good. Powerful, powerful. Jesus said, the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. When we speak the words of the kingdom, 
it is equivalent to seeds. Remember the parable of the story of the sower? We just read that. When we, again, speak the words of the kingdom, it's equivalent to seeds of the life of God. And when received in a good heart, the good soil, it grows inside a person and reproduces. It reproduces. I said, it reproduces more seed so that you can bring forth fruit 100, 60, 30, whatever it is, as you determine, hear that, as you determine to bring forth that fruit, as you determine to get into God's Word, as you determine to pray, as you determine that this is what I am all about. Because God made seed in the beginning after its own kind, we can expect that the life of heaven, God, grows, inhabits, is inside of us. And heaven, the Spirit, breaks loose in us. Come on. We're talking about some pretty simple things. We're talking about seeds. But you know what? <laughs> I thought it was pretty interesting that seeds in the Greek comes from the word sperma. <laughs> so as we see this here, we know it's going to find a place where it falls. Rocky soil, with soil with thorns and weeds that choke it out, soil that maybe has no depth and persecutions come, challenges come across and it just fades out, gives up. Or that seed, that sperma, is going to burrow in and it's going to find the soil that we are opening to the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's go to that last screen there. We're going to be closing here. I wanted this message to be pretty bullet, bullet pointed simple. I wanted it to be an encouragement to each and every one of us that we could pick up how very important it is that we abide in Christ. Because as we press into prayer truly, ask God to give you understanding of what that means. As we take time to declare, hey everybody, this is the Bible. This is what my life is all about. This is what gives me life. This is what instructs me in life. This is what encourages me in my daily activities. And I think as we begin to understand who we are in Christ, as we Understand, of course, who our Father is and the love, hallelujah, that He has for us. Then we draw in a little bit closer and that seed presses and pushes in a little bit deeper. And we pray a little bit longer now don't misunderstand me. Length of prayers means nothing if the quality isn't there. That's why I'm so thankful for the Holy Ghost. Baptism in the Holy Ghost where God has given me a personal prayer language filled 
with the power that I can groan. Don't even know how to pray for some of you, but I can pray. I can be there. As we begin to know who we are in Christ and what he did for each and every one of us. Coming up into the season here, people in the world call it Easter. We call it Resurrection Sunday. I call him Jesus because he's risen. But as we come into that season, we start to get kind of brought back into understanding that Jesus Christ was the sacrificial lamb that paid the price for you and I once and for all. I'm talking, that's some serious stuff. Because even as we saw and we read in that Garden of Gethsemane moment when Jesus asked three close disciples to pray. We see the nature of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, as he was manifested in this earth. He was flesh and blood like you and I. He asked his disciples to pray. We know the story. They began praying. Jesus went off. He came back after a while. They're asleep. He wakes them up. Says, come on, come on. Keep going. Keep going. He goes off and he prays again. Does it same thing. As Jesus is praying, we get an understanding that Jesus truly was like you and I. Because he asked his father, can I remind you? He said, if it's possible, father, take this from me. I don't want to die. Am I right? We see that nature of Jesus Christ. But what did he say? Nevertheless. Not my will, but thine be done. And he goes and he prays again. He keeps pressing in to prayer. Until finally, that crushing, that presence, that aroma of that sweet incense arises. Because it says that it became, as it were, drops of blood. Sweat, as it were, drops of blood. That's the pressing. That's the crushing where that fragrance, where that anointing was released. And he said, okay, I'll do it. I love you that much. I'll die for you. God is so good. God, you are so good. Who do you say that I am? Who is Jesus to you? Come on. Are we pressing in? Are we taking time to read his word? Or is it three minutes I read my devotional? I'm good. Are you? I hope you are. But I'm saying there's more. We want to be a winning team like Coach Vince Lombardi. <laughs> Better than that. Yeah, amen. We're going to have to press. We're going to have to hold ourselves up there and say, Lord, whatever 
I need to do. I want more of you. Jesus came to his disciples. He heard what people were saying about him, but he asked his disciples, he asks you and me, who do you say that I am? Well, some say this, some say that. Peter came back with the right answer. He said, this is what I know. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's what this church is built on. That's what this foundation is all about. And it's a solid foundation. 